So we're going to start with our confession today. I am here on purpose because I have a purpose. My, My heart, heart is open. My, My mind is, is ready to receive because God is not finished with me yet. My best days are right in front of me. And I have victory in my life because Jesus lives in me. Amen. Amen. Give God praise this morning. Hallelujah. You can be seated. I forgot that I'm wired a different way today. Hallelujah. I said, I've got so many wires on me. And my Lord said, and your jewelry between all of that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everybody say, God is good. It's good to have joy in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you don't know it, tell your face. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I will not be moved by the look on people's faces. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. My face didn't look so swell this morning myself. Pastor Bill's car, his battery won't work. How many of you know when a man's car does not work? It is not a happy house. <laughs> I mean, he has been charging that battery since yesterday afternoon. I think it's not going to work. Uh, so he's not here with us today, but he said he would be watching online to be sure I did everything right. So let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that it's true, Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Lord, help us to be what the Bible says. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And as Aaron's been teaching, Lord, on Wednesday nights, such a great class on happiness is not about our circumstances. Happiness is about the fact that we win. We are overcomers. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And therefore, our happiness is rooted deep within us and brings great joy. We thank you for your presence here today, Lord. And Lord, just guide us as we share this word. Help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. I'm going to uh, share today from Psalm 27, one of my favorite psalms in the Bible, probably because it was at a time in my life when I was the most troubled, when I could see no answers, uh, when things weren't going the way I wanted them to, and other people weren't doing what I wanted them to do. How many of you have ever had that situation? And due to all the circumstances, I certainly had no joy. Uh, I was very fearful, confused, all the things that happen when you're not in the presence of God. Everybody say, the priority, the priority. of the presence of God. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I truly believe that in our nation we have slipped away from um, just reverence for God in the fact that people used to just go to church, even if it was just to uh, do what they were supposed to do. They showed up in the presence, everybody say, the presence of God, even if it was just on Sunday. It was something, I believe, that kept people on the, the right path in the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Maybe not in doing the right thing all the time, but at least being aware that there is a God, and that if God be for us, who can be against us? And that we do have a life to live that's full of the grace and glory of God. That there is hope. All those things that come from being in the presence of God that maybe not the church itself brought but whenever two or three are gathered in his name, he says, there I am in the midst of them. So whenever people gather together, because it's time to honor the Lord. Everybody say, it's time to honor the Lord. You know, uh, in the morning times on Sunday, I drive by a few houses. And I just say, thank you, Lord, that all the people on this street love Jesus. And more than anything, they want to honor you by being in your house one time a week for a couple hours just to say how much they love you. Amen? Amen? And I think because of that, we can look at the world today and we can say, well, it's just the way it goes. No, it's just the way it goes when people abandon God. It's the way it goes when people don't have their priorities in order or have their, um, even if it's just because back in my day, my grandma my, she was my great-grandma, actually. If you didn't show up in church, it would not go well with you that week. You got no sourdough cookies. 
She didn't show up at the house with a smile on her face. She didn't come down and make us homemade noodles. We were on her list. And even though she told me, God's going to get you, at least it got me to church. It got me in church from the time I was a little girl. And so even in high school, when I, would, uh, when I was called on to be in the choir because my voice teacher, my clarinet teacher, my choir director at high school, was the director of the church choir. And my grandmother, of course, was one of the founders of that church. So we did go to church. And I did go to choir rehearsal at 16 every Thursday night with all the old people. <laughs> Me and three other young people. And I went every Thursday night. And when the organ, organist decided to move, my grandmother said, you will play the organ. So I played the organ every Sunday morning. I had to be there early. And, and I did that, and then when I got married and I and my first child, the pastor of a church came and said, we heard you play the organ, we need you at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning to play the organ. And I did that with a, two, a baby, a two-year-old, and a three-year-old. 8 o'clock in the morning, every Sunday morning, was there to play the organ. Did I enjoy it? Uh, no. Not at 6 o'clock when I had to get everybody ready. But my life, when I look back, as I was preparing this message, I have lived in the house of the Lord. I have truly lived in the house of the Lord all my life, since I was 16. And even though I did not really rejoice in doing all of that, God did something in me. He got a hook in me that I could never, ever get away from. And it drew me to a place where when I really went in the ditch, I had something to hold on to. Everybody say one thing. I want to talk to you about that today. And in Tulsa, 1979, this is one of the scriptures that God gave me. And now it was real real to me at that time because I felt all alone. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you feel like, I don't know where I'm going. I, I know where I've been. Just like that song says, I'm not going to live in my shame. But I'm coming out of that place, and I'm going to live in a different place. And I'm going to live the life God called me to. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me, came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamped against me, my heart shall not fear. Now this is a psalm of David. This is when David is being pursued by Saul, the king that is in authority at that time. He's been anointed king. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he's having to run from this guy because he wants to kill him. And so if you've read the Psalms, a lot of them are David's Psalms. In my Bible reading and in the plan we have, you'll be reading along in 1 Samuel, and then it will take you to all the Psalms of David. And you begin to see, you know, um, some people might think he was bipolar, schizophrenic. I mean, some of his psalms start out in the ditch. They come out of the ditch, and then by the end, he's back in the ditch again. You got to read the next psalm to get back up on the mountaintop. His life was a life of trouble. Everybody say trouble. For all of his life, he had an adversary, the devil, and the devil used Saul, the devil used the Philistines, the devil used all kinds of circumstances against his life. So when he wrote this, he's writing this really from the perspective of, I have victory. Everybody say, I have victory. Because he's saying, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He's in a place where he's recognizing that everything he is, everything he's done, everything that he's accomplished is because of the Lord and what the Lord has done in his life. This, this whole scripture, at that time in my life, I was afraid of everything. I didn't have enough money. Uh, I had three kids. Uh, I was alone, didn't have family. I was working at Oral Roberts University, which was a great thing. That was the best thing right then in my life to add to my life. Uh, I had a little church I went to and took my kids to on Sunday, but I wasn't in, incorporated into that body. So I truly, it was me and the Lord and my kids. And uh, I can tell you, if you're here today and you're single, or even if you're married and feel single, the Lord is your source. Everybody say, he's my source. 
And so it said one thing. Everybody say one thing. I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing. Everybody say one thing. I believe that one thing, and I was listening this week to a, a message by Bill Johnson. I don't know why God's had me. They just come up in my phone. And uh, he was preaching on this. And it just made me really reflect on my life. Sometimes it's good to reflect on your life and think about all the good things that God has done in your life. Not all those other things that we tend to spill our thoughts over into, but all the good things that God has done. Except for the grace of God, there go I. You know, just like anybody else, I got a call this week. We're going to do the funeral for a young man about 35 years old who overdosed. And he's, he's in heaven, but he, he's not going to get the life he was called to live. Life is fragile. And in the world today, I believe the word the Lord gave me this week, after I had watched this, really brought me back to what is the one thing, Pam, that is still the number one thing in your life? Everybody say the number one thing. Amen. You know, it can be all kinds of things. But as, as he began to speak to me about it, it was like, you want to know what happened to the world? The world left me. The world left me. I'm in Jeremiah right now, my Bible reading. It's like reading about America. It's, it's about reading, it's, it's like reading about America and how in this nation that was by God, for God, put in the earth for such a time as this, has completely turned their back. I'm not saying us that are sitting here today, but if you look at the polls in an election and you see that 50% of our nation would vote for someone's party platform, that says we believe in abortion, even to the last stages. And we don't believe in helping those that may survive abortion, but they, would, they will just let them die. We believe in transgender. We believe in changing young people from one sex to another outwardly, which you can never do inwardly. But we believe in that. And we will, we will support anything that allows that to happen. Everybody say, that's a far slide <laughs> from truth. And yet 50%, it says in the polls, I believe in that's not true. It's not about a candidate, folks. It's about evil and good that's trying to destroy people's lives. The people that God created. God created all humans all humans, and he loves them. How could the Christian community be so far to that left side that they would believe that that's what they would vote for? How could that be? How could that be? I don't believe that it's because people don't go to church, although I, just as I said earlier, I believe going to church certainly is a step in the right direction. And associating with people, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves with other people of like faith. But it's not just that. It's that people have done exactly what it says in Second Timothy. As believers, as people who had a reverence for God at some point in their life, now are in things that they don't even feel it. They don't even recognize that there's conviction because it's so easy to just flow in this arena because the one thing, everybody say the one thing, does not have first place anymore. It's buried back there in all kinds of activities. You know, I am, I'm all for all the things that we do today in the world. And, you know, I, I have a little great-granddaughter that she's in gymnastics She's three. She's actually a Purdue cheerleader. She wears her dress, and she knows the cheers, and she does them. She goes to cheer. She's, she's just the cutest little thing. Every night, she's busy, and she's three. She's very busy. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're just as busy. Everybody say, just as busy looking at the things of God on a regular basis. Because it's when we look into his face that we're changed from glory to glory. And so I'm not against any of that. 
you know, I go watch all my great grandchildren and their sports and everything. But it, God needs more time than that takes in a child's life. Back here today, we had breakfast club. You know, we'd have breakfast club every week if it would get kids here. Because I want kids in the presence of God. Everybody say, in the presence of God. When you're in the presence of God, it says in Psalm 16, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So this word, one thing. You know, when David got in all those situations, Saul continually trying to destroy him. It says, in the time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion. In his secret place of his tabernacle, he will hide me. He shall set me high on a rock. You know, he, he hid in a lot of caves to get away from Saul. He had a life where he was being chased, and not just chased because Saul was mad at him. He wanted to kill him. We know he was a worshiper because he wrote all these psalms, and all these psalms are worship songs. Uh, you know, he, he actually was called by Saul to play for him when his evil spirits got on him. And so he would play a flute or whatever he played. He said, played with his hands music to console Saul. And Saul had a spear this one time when he went to sing. That would be a warning to me. Right then, if I was there to try to help somebody and they had a spear in their hand, he, he threw the spear two different times to try to kill him. So he experienced trouble all the time. You know, we experience trouble today, and sometimes our troubles seem like a lot because they affect our lives. But this man did great things for God. I mean, he is a man after God's own heart. You read about it in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, they're still talking about David. Paul is still talking about David and the man that he was for God. How did he do all of that? Because he had one thing. Everybody say one thing. That was his primary focus. If you look at the whole psalm, it goes on and he talks about, now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in this tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. That's in the same breath of, as my enemies are against me. I have trouble all the time, but I will sing. Everybody say, I will sing. And then he goes on, it says in verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God, my salvation. He had thoughts that would put a fear in him, but he would talk to God. Everybody say, Talk to God. So many times when we are fearful, we run to somebody to try to help us, and everybody say, he is the helper. But he's the one thing, the one person who in our lives can really strengthen us and hold us up in those times of trouble. It goes on, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. That particular scripture right there really spoke to me at that time in 1979, because I was alone with my three kids in Tulsa. My family was all in business with my ex-husband in Indiana. He had plenty of money. He had a really good job. All my family was prospering, and I was making four thirty-five an hour, spent $35 on groceries, had three kids by myself, worked at ORU all day, every day, taking care of my family, and up half the night, at least reading the Word of God, but sometimes terrorized. And I did feel like everybody left me. Where'd they all go? You know, here I am out here, and I never hear from anybody. You know, back then, we didn't have cell phones. So if you called somebody, it costs money. You know, I don't know if all of you remember that. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. But there was a time when you called people on your phone that you got charged extra money on your telephone bill. So I didn't have money to call people. And so I'm just there. But God took care of me every single day. And one time, my son wanted a ball glove. I didn't have money for a ball glove because I was going to use my money to get my hair cut 
this is a little short, I know. My, my hairstylist is wonderful, but she got excited with the razor when she was cutting my hair talking, and then all my hair was on the floor. <laughs> but hair grows. So, but back then, I didn't, I didn't have money to go get my hair done. I didn't have money to do anything except buy food and pay the bills. And so in this place, you know, this psalm was like a life thing, lifeline to me. And, and it, when they leave me, then, then God's going to take care of me. And one day my mother called, and she said, just at the time I had this hair appointment, this is the truth. She called me and said, honey, I was driving by the bank today, and I just felt to put $35 in your checking account. Well, I was able to get my hair done, and my son got a, a ball glove. All was well at my house. Amen? Because when you're alone with three kids, you want it to be well at your house. God is good. Everybody say, God is good. This one thing I have desired, I sat at my keyboard every night. I mean, every night. You can ask my daughter. My sons, they still talk about it, especially my son, Matthew. We, he said, we just kept yelling, stop playing the piano. Stop playing, because they were trying to sleep. But that was my life. Everybody say, my life. I would play and get in his presence, and I would cry like I was having a nervous breakdown every night. And I was afraid somebody would take my kids if they knew it, so I didn't tell anybody. And I would just cry all the time for like nine months. And then suddenly the faucet turned off, and life was there. I felt loved. I felt free. It was all because of him. Everybody say one thing. And I didn't feel left alone because I was not alone. Then it goes on. When my father and mother forsake me, let the Lord take care of me. Then teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me in your smooth paths because of my enemies. And back then, I didn't know who was my enemy. I thought it was people. I thought it was my circumstances. I thought it was my kids on some days. Uh, you know, it's just, it was a very hard time. And then it goes on, do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart. Everybody say, would have lost heart. In the translation I was reading at that time, it says, I would have fainted. I can honestly say there were times where I thought, I am going to faint. I can't do this. I cannot do this. And you look today at what I'm doing, and you think, gee, she's probably always had it together. No. In fact, I don't have it together some days right now. If that scares you, you can go find a church where everybody's got it all together, but I'm not one of those pastors. <laughs> I, I have to fight my way through things, just like you fight your way through things. But what happened was this. I would have fainted. Unless. Everybody say, unless. Everybody say, there's always hope. I would have fainted unless I would have believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know, I was first born again. I was in the uh, Assemblies of God. And I remember this guy named Joe. He'd get up there and sing, when we all get to heaven and victory in Jesus. And I had none of that. You know, I thought heaven might be the best answer. But in the land of the living, everybody say land of the living. That means in the here and now, when the word of God says that he wants us to have life and life more abundantly, he means here. Not, I mean, heaven, we won't have a care. We, everything, I don't know what it's like there. I had somebody ask me the other day, D do you think they eat food in heaven? I thought, well, I haven't got to that chapter yet. And I don't know if we eat food in heaven, but I know this. We're going to worship all the time. Everybody say one thing. When we desire to be in the house of the Lord, when we desire to spend time in his presence, everything in our life can be healed. Everything in our life can be, we can be delivered from it. Everything that holds us down can be taken out when we're worshiping God. That's why the Bible says, you know, come and worship. Come, come and worship. Worship Christ.
Because when you worship him, he becomes real to you. And then it says, wait on the Lord. Everybody say, wait. Nobody really likes to wait. But this is what it says. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Wait is not depressed, sad, and with no expectancy. Aaron shared a little bit on this on Wednesday night. You know, hope is anticipation that something really good is about to happen. That's hope. That's the same way with this. It's in anticipation that something really great is about to happen when it doesn't look great at all. What David was saying is, I've learned to just stay focused on one thing. No matter what's happening around me, I keep my focus on one thing. And that one thing is that I've desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Amen? You know, when I'm here on Sunday morning and I'm playing that keyboard, I mean, I've already been to church. By the time we rehearse and we get ready to do this, it, it's what brings the anointing. It's what puts you in a place where you can really share from the heart of God because you're like in it. You're in the flow. And I know not everybody is a singer, but you don't have to be a singer to be in the presence of God. Now, I just tell on myself because that's what this message is about. Everybody say, wait on the Lord. Wait. Say one thing. Okay. Well, I, I would listen to this message, uh, as I said, by Bill Johnson. And um, I love to hear him preach because he's a worshiper. And when worshipers preach, it's different a lot of times than when you're just somebody. I mean, everything, all the fivefold gifts are great. But when a worshiper preaches, because they spend so much time in the Lord, they suck you in to where the presence of the Lord is. And, um, and so I, I was listening to him, and it was like it just stirred me up. I was just like I was living again in 1979 when God said, I'm going to heal you. You'll have no more fear. And my love will take out all the fear, and you will know you're loved. He did it. He did it. It was the hardest time in my life with the greatest result. And it all came from his presence. So I'm sitting out here in the parking lot. Melba said this week to me, I looked out. I didn't see your car in the parking lot. I said, well, I was on my way up here because they just know that's where I am. Every day I, that I come, I go sit in the parking lot. Even on Saturday when nobody's here, I sit in the parking lot. I sit in my car. Why? Because it's where he talks to me. It's where he meets with me. Everybody say, in his presence. I could not do anything that I do except for him. A wife, a mom, a grandma, a great-grandma, a pastor, a sister, a, you know, all those things. It's because of his presence. Everybody say his presence. So I'm sitting there, and uh, I, I just was waiting on the Lord because I had done my Bible reading, and uh, sometimes it's just like a goes by my face. And it was... Um, and, and this word, you know, maybe it will strike a chord with you. It really struck a chord with me. Don't let yourself be desensitized. Don't let yourself be desensitized. You're becoming desensitized. I thought, hallelujah, plead the blood. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. I think I do this, I do this 24-7. I live ministry 24-7. How could I be desensitized? And he said, because you don't come to spend time with me anymore. When you play your keys, it's a job. It's what you have to do. But you don't just come sing to me. I was just like, do I have to tell everybody about this? Could I just say that you can become desensitized if you don't stay in the present? Do I have to say it's me? He said, yes, say it's you. Because if it can happen to you, it can happen to anybody. I am a worshiper. I love to worship God. Lori has taken over the worship, and I praise God 
for her doing all of that. I mean, I have to tell myself, you don't have to think about that. I go to think about it, and I think, oh, don't have to think about it. But then I felt like the Lord said, now you have time to come to the sanctuary and just sing to me. See, that's the first song I heard. And my son always sings it to me, my son Matt. But he likes to tease me, but it was a song. It was a few little notes. I never played a piano except by notes, music, not by ear. I still don't do it very well. But I heard, sing for me, sing for me. Oh, my child, won't you sing for me? Sing for me, child, won't you sing for me? Child, won't you sing for me? I'm thinking, really? That's the thing I don't like to do. I don't like to sing in front of people. He said, you don't have to sing in front of people. Sing for me. So I would sit every night at my keyboard, and I would sing. He said, when you sing, I'll come. I'll come. And so I haven't done that in a long, long time. I used to do it all the time. In the other building, I would go on Saturday night, and I would go in the sanctuary, and I would sing. Desensitized. Everybody say desensitized. The world is desensitized. That is the result of not putting one thing first. And this is to become desensitized, to make insensitive or non-reactive to a sensitizing agent. The Spirit of God is a sensitizing agent, the Holy Spirit. He sensitizes us so that we immediately, immediately are convicted if we're going to be getting into trouble. Everybody say, thank God. Thank God. Now, it can be just things we shouldn't do. It can be pleasure. It can be anything. But when the Holy Spirit, and we're sensitized, we will know, stop. Everybody say, stop. How many of you know if you raise children on a highway, you want them to know the word stop? You don't, you don't want them to run into the street. So they have to learn, obey, stop. Everybody say, stop. The same way with God. There's a lot of things on the highway of life that can take us out. Not always is it quick. Most times it's very slow. Just like what the Lord said to me this week. You're becoming desensitized. I'm thinking, well, I think I'm pretty sensitive. You can ask Pastor Bill. I I get upset about a lot of things. I am not desensitized. I am very sensitized. But it's to his presence. Everybody say, to his presence to his voice. You know, people say, well, I don't hear God. Well, then you need to get alone with God and put on some praise music and just sit there and just let him start to move in your situation and begin to tell you what we need to do in this situation. Um, if, if you read Ezekiel, and I think this, the Lord just brought this back to me, uh, you know, Ezekiel's kind of a hard one to read because Israel's been in all kinds of trouble. Um, Basically, like all of us, like the people of the world, um, opportunities, flesh got in the way, got caught up in a bunch of stuff. Um, And and they're they're not as close to God as they need to be. And this is what he says. I will give them one, one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart. Everybody say stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, still a heart of flesh, because your heart still has to beat, still has to feel. But then he says, that they may walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Uh, In the New Covenant, in Hebrews, it says, he will write his laws in our heart. When Jesus takes over our heart, it's still flesh. It has to beat, but it has a new voice that speaks into that heart, and it becomes softened. Everybody say, softened. And um, if you look at the synonyms for 
insensitive, stony-hearted, thick-skinned, heartless, hard-boiled. Everybody say hard-boiled. Iron-hearted. You know, I say to you today, are you hard-boiled? You know, a hard-boiled egg, when you crack it, it, it it's, it's a hard-boiled egg. If you crack an egg that's not hard-boiled, it just all over. You know, is the Holy Spirit able to flow through our heart, or is our heart hard-boiled? The Lord spoke to me about that. He said, there's things all the time that happen to you. Things that happen to me, things that happen to you that will harden your heart. We all let it happen because we don't want to be hurt. We don't want to feel pain. We don't, we don't want to feel that. The Lord told me, if you don't feel pain, you won't feel love. When he healed my heart, he said, it's like you have something around your heart that's stopping it from beating because you have all this stuff and it's hard-hearted. Everybody say hard-hearted. In the presence of the Lord, you can't stay hard-hearted. I guarantee you, you will eventually weep. You will eventually weep because his love is so overwhelming when it can break through that place of hard-heartedness. When I look at the world today, I felt like the Lord said, this is the way you can pray for the people of the world, that their insensitivity will be broken over their lives, and again, they will become sensitive. Everybody say sensitive. sensitive. This isn't about personalities. This isn't about, you know, whether you're phlegmatic or what all those different words are, you know, saying what's not. It's not about that. It's about how you operate in the presence of the Lord. Everybody say presence of the Lord. And so as I was doing this, um, I thought, well, Lord, what do we do? You know, how do we practice your presence on a regular basis? In today's life that I live, you know, in that time that I was raising my children, I was working every night. I sat and praised the Lord probably for two or three hours. I just had me a Methodist or a Baptist hymnal thing, and I just played through it every night. And I sang all kinds of songs. And But God then began to give me songs. Everybody say, give me songs. God will give you songs. God will sing to you. It says in the Bible he sings over his people. In his presence is where God does things that we can only try to fix. He fixes them. Everybody say, he fixes them. And I think in our world today, we've become so busy that, um, at least in my life, uh, it can happen in ministry, just like what I'm doing, even though I spend all my time in ministry. I spend all my time praying with people, going to the hospital, talking to people, counseling people, uh, all the word. Everybody say the word. But he says that I'm getting desensitized. I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, there was a day when I would watch TV, and uh, my husband and my Uncle Gene, you know, he lived with us, and uh, God was healing him of alcohol. And um, they, would, they would laugh at me. I couldn't even watch the news. If somebody got hurt, I would just about be in tears. I, I had to get away. I go to my room. I mean, I, I couldn't do it. Now I watch stuff, people shooting each other up. I watch NCIS. I watch all their shows. Nothing wrong with those shows. What I'm saying is I'm desensitized because it's, it doesn't do anything to me. I just watch it. And uh, because it's the way the world is. But it's not the world I live in. Everybody say, it's not the world I live in. The world I live in is the presence of God. And to be ready for what God wants to do in the world today as a believer, we got to get back in his presence. It's got to become the number one thing. Then our troubles will be taken care of. David, his battles were fought by God. Go read it in the Old Covenant. He didn't fight those battles. God fought those battles. But it was because he was so close to God that he, he didn't have to fight the battle. 
he was close to God. But if you look at the ways the enemy tried to stop him, look at not just Saul, but he had Zitlag when his whole family was stolen away. And he said to God, what should I do? And God said, pursue and you'll get it all back. He could do that because God was the one thing. He was the one thing that every time something happened, he went to him. If there was trouble, he went to God. And God showed him exactly what to do. Because he had that one thing that he sought all the time to be in the presence of God. We don't read about it so much. We saw what happened when he let go of it once with Bathsheba. You think, how did a guy like that, how did he end up sleeping with another man's wife and killing the man on top of it? If he was so a man after God's own art, he was desensitized. Everybody say desensitized. Somewhere along the way, he stepped away. We live a busy life, folks. But when I heard this message, I thought, this is what we have to do for where we are in this nation. I know we need to pray. Uh, When you get in the presence of God, you pray because you hear God. And and he'll speak to you. Uh, Can you put me on this mic? Thank you. Um, There's a psalm. It's in Psalm 62, I think. What's it say up there, Crystal, the psalm? It's uh, it's David. It's in the third part of my message. It's a psalm. I should have brought it over here with me. Yeah, could you put that up on the screen? My soul waits silently for God alone. My expectation, everybody say expectation, is in Him. Where's your expectation today? Um, Go on, let's go on. He only is my rock of my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God, my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him with all at all times, you people. This is David. It's another psalm. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than a vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase... Do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice. I have heard this. The power belongs to God. And later I found this psalm. You are my salvation. You are my rock. You are my salvation. Psalm 3. You're the glory and the lifter of my head. When you get in His presence, there's healing you know, we, we all want to be healed, and we have things that have hurt us. In His presence, you can be healed because He becomes the one thing. Everybody say the one thing. Yeah, would you stand with me this morning? Thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you bring us to our feet when we think about all your grace and your mercy. Think about this this morning, right where you are. You bring us to our feet in in adoration of you, Jesus. How much you love us, even when we made mistakes, even when we do it wrong. Though we can't understand what maybe, maybe you can't understand today what God sees in you that would cause him to lay down his life on Calvary. But it just, it just brings you to your feet. It just causes you to Come to attention and love him. Lord, I pray for every person here in this church today. I thank you that they will become comfortable in your presence. That they will begin to take time. Because this world is going to get darker and darker, but nothing changes in your presence. Everything remains bright, remains hopeful, becomes 
a place of security, a place of rest, a place of safety and security. I pray for every person in this church that maybe today you have things, shackles on your mind, shackles on your heart, chains that have held you. The Bible says that when you get in his presence, those chains, they begin to fall off. They, they fall to the ground. They have no value anymore. They have no hold over you. No hold. I pray today that you will wake us up, Lord. Wake us up to the, the needs around us, in our homes, in other people's lives. Don't let us become desensitized, Lord. And if that's you today and you say, I, I know I am des des desensitized. Please don't let it be that you can't go do anything, you can't watch anything on TV. Just make sure that in your life, Jesus is getting as much attention as those things that take our life on a daily basis. I just, for me, I felt, get back in there. Get back in that sanctuary and praise me, which I'm going to do because he said, what is it that for you? What is he saying to you today that's going to keep you from a place of being desensitized and, and the enemy getting a place? Whatever that is, Listen and do what God says to do. Even if it's uncomfortable at first. Even if, even if you don't have time. Make time. Make time for His presence. And let it be the priority. Once again. That He was maybe in the beginning. Or maybe some other time in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for your presence in this place. Let us be changed forevermore as we take time to be in your presence. I ask you, Lord, to bring every person in this congregation to their feet. And everybody said, Amen. Turn to somebody next to you and say, God sure loves you. Amen. Let's make our confession before we go. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, I am steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing my labor is not in vain. Amen. Go and be blessed today. We want to thank you so much for joining us at Victory Online. Our hope is that today's message encouraged and blessed you. If you are looking for additional ways to connect to Victory or you would like more information on what we believe, you can find all of that at our website at victorylafayette.org. If you would like to sow a seed into furthering the vision of victory where we share the love, acceptance, and forgiveness of Jesus with everyone, you can do that on our website as well under the giving tab. Most importantly, if you prayed the prayer of salvation at the end of today's message, we are so excited to be a part of this new beginning. We want to provide you with additional resources to help you grow in this new relationship with Jesus Christ. Please contact us through our website. There are various ways to connect with us, as I mentioned before, or give us a call in our offices, 765-447-7777. We would love to personally pray with you and, again, provide you with those additional resources free of charge. We want to thank you again so much for joining us at Victory Online, and we hope to see you again soon.